You know how in horror films they usually start off with a group of people engaging in some carefree activity. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Let's just stop us the contrast with the horror that's going to follow. Well, in Thai horror films, the carefree activity is the family going to make merit together. That's the ultimate contrast with the, the spirit or whatever. And by the way, spirits in Thai films don't appear as pale ectoplasms. They're pretty gruesome. At any rate, that for them is a sign of a healthy family, making merit together, being generous, observing the precepts. Just watching a video of a, a Sangha Raja of Cambodia commenting how his little child, one of his favorite activities, was going down to the temple with his grandmother and observing the precepts. That's a genuinely healthy kind of happiness, because you're not only happy yourself, but you're creating happiness for others, and you're learning that there is a, such a thing as a happiness that doesn't have boundaries. There are actions that are beneficial for you and for other people. It's not the case that as human beings we constantly have to struggle and steal things away from one another. There are ways we can be happy to make other people happy as well. You probably know the Chinese character for a wedding is two characters for happiness, double happiness, which I would disagree with. It would be much better if they put double happiness for merit. You're happy and the other person is happy. It's all harmless. In Thailand they also recognize it as good medicine for the mind when someone is really disturbed. One of the common things is to take that person to the monastery and make merit. So it's important then, we here in the West, who tend to look down on merit as children's Buddhism, develop an appreciation for it. It's actually an important part of the practice. You read scholarly books that talk about karmic Buddhism and nibbanic Buddhism. It's a, the first one is concerned with merit, the other one is concerned with wisdom. You can't really divide things in that way, though, because what is wisdom? It's a search for true happiness. That's what the first question of wisdom is. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And the first answers are to be generous and to be, to be virtuous, to observe the precepts, and then to develop good qualities of mind. That's the beginning of wisdom because it shows that you understand that your happiness depends on your actions, and you want long-term. And long-term has to be harmless, because if your happiness is harming somebody else, it's not going to last. And you don't feel good about it either. You may block off certain parts of your personality to pretend that you're okay, but that creates a dissonance in the mind. And the Buddha points out to many ways in which merit is necessary for the meditation. As he said, if you're stingy, you won't be able to reach the jhanas, much less any of the noble attainments. And although it is possible to attain concentration, when you're breaking the precepts, the dishonesty of breaking the precepts is going to mar the quality of that concentration. It's not going to lead to genuine discernment. So it's important that we realize that when we're practicing meditation, it needs to be based on a foundation of meritorious activity. All these practices, generosity, virtue, meditation, the medicine for the mind. They help cure the diseases of greed, aversion, and delusion, and develop good, healthy qualities in their place. The act of generosity shows that you can think about the needs of other people 
And that's necessary if you're going to develop a path at all. Because after all, this is a happiness that's meant to be harmless. And you're not going to see the value of a harmless happiness unless you realize that you have some sympathy for other people's needs, too. And the same with the precepts, realizing that your actions do have consequences. And you can't just erase them by thinking them away. I was reading a romantic novel in which the main character makes some really bad decisions that end up leading to the, the death of the woman he loves and the death of his best friend. And then at the end of the novel he's gone off to be a hermit and he thinks about, well, life still goes on. It doesn't matter what I did. The people I love are still there someplace in the stars and in, in the infinitude of life. Well, that's a very selfish way of dealing with the regrets you might have over your actions, thinking in ways in which, well, your actions don't matter. After all, someday the sun's going to go nova. Everything we do is going to be wiped out and then recreated into new stars and planets, and it's all okay. That's huge delusion, and it's huge insensitivity to the needs of others. Some people find trouble thinking about that. They get disturbed about it the fact that they may have harmed others. But part of wisdom is realizing, okay, we may have made mistakes in the past, so that doesn't mean we have to keep on making them. We can change our ways, and that's one of the things that merit teaches you. You can learn how to be more skillful in your actions, and it does make a real difference. Another thing the practice of merit teaches you is a healthy sense of shame. We're often told here in the West that shame is debilitating, and we want all our kids to have healthy self-esteem. Self well, healthy self-esteem has to have its other side as well, which is that you realize that certain actions are beneath you. And if you don't have that sense, okay, your esteem is meaningless. But if you know for sure okay, you wouldn't kill, you wouldn't steal, you wouldn't have illicit sex under any circumstances, there's a very healthy pride that goes with that. And it's that self-esteem that allows you to meditate with a clear conscience and also to meditate with a sense that you really are here doing something that you should be doing. It's the natural next step. So it's not the case that the practice of meditation is one thing and the practice of merit is something else. They go together. It's easier for the mind to calm down when you've been generous and observing the precepts. And the practice of being generous and observing the precepts helps you develop your discernment. After all, it helps you calculate when you have something. Hey, would it be better to give this, or do I need it? Keep it. You start realizing exactly how much do you need. There are times when you realize that you give too much and it's harmful, and the Buddha never recommends that. But he does say, you reflect on how much you actually need in life in terms of material things, because you're a lot better off when you can travel lightly. And John Lee talks about all our favorite possessions as being like magnets here in the world. The more magnets you have, the more you're pulled here, stuck here. So it's good to learn how to have a sense of just right and how much you need and how much you don't need. After all, a lot of wisdom lies in moderation and finding out what the point of just right is. It's not something that can be known through talking about it or writing abstract treatises. It comes from looking at what your actual needs are and feeling out, <coughs> excuse me, finding out exactly what is necessary and what's not. The precepts also teach wisdom and discernment, because once you've made up your mind that you're not going to kill or lie or steal, how are you going to deal with termites? How are you going to deal with ants? 
how you're going to deal with situations where someone is really difficult and really dangerous without killing. That requires a higher level of discernment than just killing whatever is in inconvenient. You start thinking outside the box. The same with the precept against lying. There are times when you realize if you tell the truth about a situation or tell the whole truth about a situation, it's going to actually harm somebody. So how do you describe the situation at the same time not reveal the information that would be harmful? Or how do you avoid the questions that might be asked that would force you to reveal it? This requires that you think very strategically about your speech and also think strategically about the actions of your life. So if you do something you know that, okay, if somebody comes and asks you questions about it, it's going to be trouble. How do you prepare for that? You don't just wait until they come and ask you the questions. You've got to think about it ahead of time. So the practice of merit develops good qualities from the very beginning when it shows you, okay, it is possible for there to be a happiness that brings a family together, brings the country together, brings you and the rest of society together. And it is healing for the mind. It provides a good foundation for your meditation. So when you're practicing meditation, you realize you have to include it in the context of a meritorious life. And we don't like the word merit. It sounds like Girl Scout badges. But that's not what the Buddha is talking about. He's talking about the worth of our happiness, the worth of our actions, the worth of the mind. There's a quality to this. I was talking the other night about the professor who taught software design. I mentioned to him, I'd, I'd mentioned him in the talk, and he got going on the topic again. Saying what drives him crazy about the students he teaches is that they have no sense of quality, that there's a craft, and you wouldn't be able to be proud of your work. He found himself lecturing one of his students who had done some really sloppy computer code. So have you no shame? Have you no dignity? And it's a fascinating concept that you do computer code with dignity. But it really applies to skills in general, and this skill in particular, in particular the skill of training the mind. You want to have a sense of quality in what you do, because it gives you quality as a person. And that's what the medicine of merit is all about. 